Laura is here with us on the sofa now. So the Thought Police aren't coming. They're not, not um, yet. How Hopefully did, never. How, at the end of this investigation, what are your thoughts about AI? Do you think... Are they closer to understanding our brains? Well, it's it's a big question, and we covered loads of different AI things in the programme. But in terms of this brain tracking, well, first of all, you've got to be in an MRI scanner for it to happen. So walking along the street, we're not going to be having our minds read. And I think also the other thing that was interesting here was the people who have been experimented on for this have been in the scanner for 16 hours. I tried to have my mind read, having not done that 16 hours of data collection, on me and it came up with complete nonsense. And I promise you I wasn't thinking nonsense. <laughs> I was listening to the story like the professor was. OK, that's interesting. So as far as you were concerned, it, it didn't really work. It works if it's been trained on the person's brain, but all of our brains work differently. And right. it's looking at the blood flow, it's looking at the process someone's brain is going through when they're listening to a particular word, so that can then be reverse engineered, that they will listen to something, the MRI scanner will track their brain activity, and then it will write the words. It's using GPT-1, which is an earlier iter iteration of ChatGPT. And so it's also not even the latest technology that it's using, so it is pretty impressive. What's going on is really impressive. It's just it's not there yet on something that would be plausible to use on the go, say. But if you did manage to get wearable devices eventually with much higher resolution, then maybe for people who have any sort of medical condition that means that they can't speak, it could prove a really useful technology. Mm. And that's the key of it, isn't it? For people who struggle to communicate, there is potential for something to develop there. But how long might we have to wait for that to happen? Well, it's going to take a long time to be able to miniaturise a device to be able to do anything close to what the fMRI could do. And so it's not that easy to create a wearable device that could do anything to that level. But, of course, in terms of the amount of data that it needs to be trained on, well, for individuals, you can do that. So if somebody was using it for that purpose, of course, it would be well and truly worth doing that. I suppose what this proves is that we are just at the beginning of this revolution, aren't we? We don't really know where it's going. Exactly. We are just at the beginning. And what we're seeing here is something really impressive. It's a technology that can do something. And as time goes on, we always see devices being miniaturised. We always see more and more things becoming possible with it and real world uses. Because what we see in labs is not the real world. That's, that's an experiment. It's a demonstration. It's a proof of concept. So there's something interesting here that hopefully will progress into something very useful, whilst right now it feels rather fun. This also does sound a little bit fanciful, I suppose, doesn't it? You, when you look at the investigations you've done, but what is next for AI? What's realistic? So much. And I think we hear a lot about existential risk. The headlines that we've seen over the past few months have, of course, leapt ahead to that, about how bad things could be. But there's also enormous benefits that AI is already bringing, especially in healthcare, in tracking our health, diagnosis, managing conditions. Drug discovery, there's, there's so much that AI is doing that's positive. And in the programme, we've really tried to bring together a lot of the positive and negative side so people can come away with some real balance on where we're at now with AI. Because we keep on seeing existential risk, but what does it actually mean? And we try to get to the bottom of that for people to really understand what the risks are and what the potential benefits are that we could see. But there will be people here this morning mind-reading computers <laughs> and they're going to be scared. They're going to find this, like, terrifying in the future. Well, that's it. It's very easy to jump ahead to something that sounds so sensational. And, of course, there are problems with AI systems right now. There's big problems of bias, disinformation. And you ask an AI to do something, and it'll try and achieve that end goal, not knowing in the way that a human does all the things that should be avoided along the way. And we speak to two of the so-called godfathers of AI in the programme, and we discuss with them why they're now worried. Some of the people at the forefront of the AI revolution who got us to the point that we're at now are the ones who've been signing the letter that we should be concerned. So we're trying to create some balance here on what the reality is, what is existential risk, what should we be worried about, what should we be excited about, because there's enormous possibility. Lara, it's great to talk to you. And you can watch the Panorama programme Beyond Human, Artificial Intelligence and Us. It's on BBC iPlayer now and on BBC One at 8 o'clock.